fifteen twenty seven through fifteen thirty catherine and anne the divorce part one enough has been said in the aforgoing pages to show that henry was no more a model of marital fidelity than other contemporary monarchs it was not expected that he should be the marriages of such men were usually prompted by political reasons alone and for the indulgence of affairs of the heart kings were forced to look elsewhere than towards the princesses they had taken in fulfilment of treaties mary the younger daughter of sir thomas bolin and wife of william carey was the king's mistress for some years after her marriage in fifteen twenty one with the result that her father had received many rich grants from the crown and in fifteen twenty five was created lord rockford as treasurer of the household lord rockford was much at court and his relationship with the howards st ledgers and other great families through his marriage with lady elizabeth daughter of the duke of norfolk naturally allied him with the party of nobles whose traditions ran counter to those of the bureaucrats in henry's council his elder daughter anne who was born early in fifteen o three probably at hever castle in kent had been carefully educated in the learning and accomplishments considered necessary for a lady of birth at court and she accompanied mary tudor to france in fifteen fourteen for her fleeting marriage with the valetudinarian louis the twelfth related in an earlier chapter on queen mary's return to england a few months afterwards with her second husband charles brandon the youthful anne boleyn remained to complete her courtly education in france under the care of the new queen of france claude first wife of francis i when the alliance of the emperor and england was negotiated in fifteen twenty one and war with france threatened anne was recalled home and in fifteen twenty two began her life in the english court and with her family in their various residences her six years in the gay court of francis i during her most impressionable age had made her in manner more french than english she can never have been beautiful her face was long and thin her chin pointed and her mouth hypocritically prim but her eyes were dark and very fine her brows arched and high and her complexion dazzling above all she was supremely vain and fond of admiration similar qualities to these might have been and doubtless were possessed by a dozen other high-born ladies in henry's court but circumstances partly political and partly personal gave to them in anne's case a national importance that produced enduring consequences upon the world we have already glanced at the mixture of tedious masquerading hunting and amorous intrigue which formed the principal occupations of the ladies and gentlemen who surrounded henry and catherine in their daily life and from her arrival in england anne appears to have entered to the full into the enjoyment of such pastimes there was some negotiation for her marriage even before she arrived in england with sir piers butler an irish cousin of hers but it fell through on the question of settlements and in fifteen twenty six when she was already about twenty-three she took matters in her own hands and captivated an extremely eligible suitor in the person of a silly flighty young noble henry percy eldest son and heir to the earl of northumberland Percy was one of the court butterflies who attached themselves to Wolsey's household, and when angrily taken to task by the cardinal for flirting with Anne, notwithstanding his previous formal betrothal to another lady, the daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury, 
the young man said that, as he loved Anne best, he would rather marry her. The cardinal did not mince words with his follower, but Percy stood stoutly to his choice, and the Earl of Northumberland was hastily summoned to London to exercise his authority over his recalcitrant son. Cavendish gives an amusing account of the interview between them, at which he was present. The Earl seems to have screwed up his courage by a generous draught of wine when he left Wolsey's presence to await his son in the hall of York House. When the youth did come in, the scolding he got was vituperative in its violence, with the result that Percy was reluctantly forced to abandon the sweetheart to whom he had plighted his troth. Wolsey's interference in their love affair deeply angered both Anne and her sweetheart. Percy was a poor creature, and could do Wolsey little harm, but Anne did not forget, swearing that if ever it lay in her power, she would do to the cardinal some displeasure, which indeed she afterwards did. The reason for Wolsey's strong opposition to a match which appeared a perfectly fitting one for both the lovers, is not far to seek. Cavendish himself gives us the clue when he says that when the king first heard that Anne had become engaged to Percy, quote, he was much moved thereat, for he had a private affection for her himself, which was not yet discovered to any, end quote. And the faithful usher in telling the story, excuses Wolsey by saying that, quote, he did nothing but what the king commanded, end quote. This affair marks the beginning of Henry's infatuation for Anne. There was no reason for Wolsey to object to a flirtation between the girl and her royal admirer. Indeed, the devotion of the king to a new mistress would doubtless make him the more ready to consent to contract another entirely political marriage, if he could get rid of Catherine. And the cardinal smiled complacently at the prospect that all was going well for his plans. Anne, for the look of the thing, was sent away from court for a short time after the Percy affair had been broken off. But before many weeks were over, she was back again, as one of Catherine's maids of honor, and the king's admiration for her was evident to all observers. It is more than questionable whether, up to this time, 1526, Anne ever dreamed of becoming Henry's wife, but in any case, she was too clever to let herself go cheaply. She knew well the difference in the positions held by the king's mistresses in the French court, and that which had been occupied by her sister and Lady Talibois in England, and she coyly held her royal lover at arm's length, with the idea of enhancing her value at last. Henry, as we have seen, was utterly tired of, and estranged from, Catherine and his new flame, with her natural ability and acquired French arts, flattered and pleased his vanity better than any woman had done before. It is quite probable that she began to aim secretly at the higher prize in the spring of 1527, when the idea of the divorce from Catherine had taken shape in the king's mind under the sedulous prompting of Wolsey for his personal and political ends. But if such was the case, she was careful not to show her hand prematurely. Her only hope of winning such a game was to keep imperious Henry in a fever of love, whilst declining all his illicit advances. It was a difficult and a dangerous thing to do, for her quarry might break away at any moment, whereas if such a word as marriage between the king and her reached the ears of the cardinal, she and her family would inevitably be destroyed. 
Such was the condition of affairs when Wolsey started for France in July 1527. He went, determined to leave no stone unturned to set Henry free from Catherine. He knew that there was no time to be lost, for the letters from Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador in London, and Catherine's messenger Felipe, were on their way to tell the story to the emperor in Spain, and Clement the Seventh, a prisoner in the hands of the imperialists, would not dare to dissolve the marriage after Charles had had time to command him not to do so. It was a stiff race. Who should get to the Pope first? Wolsey's alternative plan in the circumstances was a clever one. It was to send to Rome the Bishop of Worcester, the Italian Genucci, Henry's ambassador in Spain, then, on his way home, to obtain, with the support of the cardinals of French sympathies, a, quote, general faculty, end quote, from Clement the Seventh, for Wolsey to exercise all the papal functions during the Pope's captivity, quote, by which, without informing the Pope of your, i.e. Henry's purpose, I may delegate such judges as the Queen will not refuse, and if she does, the cognizance of the cause shall be devolved upon me, and by a closetto be inserted in the general commission, no appeal be allowed from my decision to the Pope. End quote. How unscrupulous Wolsey and Henry were in the matter is seen in a letter dated shortly before the above was written, in which Wolsey says to Genucci, Bishop of Worcester, and Dr. Lee, Henry's ambassador with the emperor, that, quote, A rumor has, somehow or other, sprung up in England that proceedings are being taken for a divorce between the king and the queen, which is entirely without foundation, yet not altogether causeless. For there has been some discussion about the papal dispensation, not with any view to a divorce, but to satisfy the French, who raised the objection on proposing a marriage between the princess, Mary Tudor, and their sovereign. The proceedings which took place on this dispute gave rise to the rumor, and reached the ears of the queen, who expressed some resentment, but was satisfied after explanation. And no suspicion exists, except, perchance, the queen may have communicated with the emperor. End quote. Charles had, indeed, heard the whole story, as far as Catherine knew it, from the lips of Felipe, before this was written, and was not to be put off with such smooth lies. He wrote indignantly to his ambassador Mendoza in London, directing him to see Henry and point out to him, in diplomatic language, veiling many a threat, the danger, as well as the turpitude, of repudiating his lawful wife with no valid excuse and more vigorously still, he let the Pope know that there must be no underhand work to his detriment, or that of his family. Whilst the arrogant Cardinal of York was thus playing for his own hand first, and for Henry secondly, in France, his jealous enemies in England might put their heads together and plot against him, undeterred by the paralyzing fear of his frown. His pride and insolence, as well as his French political leanings, had caused the populace to hate him. The commercial classes, who suffered most by the wars with their best customers, the Flemings and Spaniards, were strongly opposed to him, whilst the territorial and noble party, which had usually been friendly with Catherine, and were traditionally against bureaucratic or ecclesiastical ministers of the crown, suffered with impatience the galling yoke of the Ipswich butcher's son, who drove them as he listed. Anne was in the circumstances a more powerful ally for them than Catherine. She was the niece of the Duke of Norfolk, 
the leader of the party of nobles, and her ambition would make her an apt and eager instrument. The infatuation of the king for her grew more violent as she repelled his advances, and, doubtless, at the prompting of Wolsey's foes, it soon began to be whispered that if Henry could get rid of his wife, he might marry his English favorite. Before the cardinal had been in France a month, Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador, first sounded the new note of alarm to the emperor by telling him that Anne might become the king's wife. It is hardly possible that no hint of the danger can have reached Wolsey, but if it did, he was confident of his power over his master when he should return to England. Unfortunately for him, his ideas for the king's divorce were hampered by the plans for his own advancement, and the proposals he wrote to Henry were all founded on the idea of exerting international pressure, either for the liberation of the Pope, or to obtain from the pontiff the decree of divorce. It was evident that this process must be a slow one, and Anne, as well as Henry, was in a hurry. Unlike Charles, who, though he was falsity itself to his rivals, never deceived his own ministers, Henry constantly showed the moral cowardice of his character by misleading those who were supposed to direct his policy, and at this juncture he conceived a plan of his own which promised more rapidity than that of Wolsey. Without informing Wolsey of the real object of his mission, old Dr. Knight, the king's confidential secretary, was sent to endeavor to see the Pope in St. Angelo, and by personal appeal from the king, persuade him to grant a dispensation for Henry's marriage, either before his marriage with Catherine was dissolved formally, constante matrimonial, or else, if that was refused, a dispensation to marry, after the declaration had been made nullifying the previous union, saluto matrimonio. But in either case, the strange demand was to be made, that the dispensation was to cover the case of the bride and bridegroom being connected within the prohibited degrees of affinity. Knight saw Wolsey on his way through France, and hoodwinked him as to his true mission by means of a bogus set of instructions, though the cardinal was evidently suspicious and ill at ease. This was on the 12th September, 1527, and less than a fortnight later, Wolsey hurried homeward. When he had set forth from England three months before, he seemed to hold the king in the hollow of his hand. Private audience for him was always ready, and all doors flew open at his bidding. But when he appeared on the 30th September at the Palace of Richmond, and sent one of his gentlemen to inquire of the king where he would receive him, Anne sat in the great hall by Henry's side, as was usual now. Before the king could answer the question of Wolsey's messenger, the favorite, with a petulance that Catherine would have considered undignified, snapped, quote, Where else should the cardinal come but where the king is? End quote. For the king to receive his ministers at private audience in a hall full of people was quite opposed to the usual etiquette of Henry's court and Wolsey's man still stood awaiting the king's reply, but it only came in the form of a nod that confirmed the favorite's decision. This must have struck the proud cardinal to the heart, and when he entered the hall and bowed before his sovereign, who was toying now with his lady-love and joking with his favorites, the minister must have known that his empire over Henry had for the time vanished. He was clever and crafty, he had often conquered difficulties before, and was not dismayed now that a young woman had supplanted him, for he still held confidence in himself. So he made no sign of annoyance, but he promptly tried to checkmate Knight's mission when he heard of it, 
whilst pretending approval of the king's attachment to Anne. The latter was deceived. She could not help seeing that, with Wolsey's help, she would attain her object infinitely more easily than without it, and she in turn smiled upon the cardinal, though her final success would have boded ill for him, as he well knew. His plan, doubtless, was to let the divorce question drag on as long as possible, in the hope that Henry would tire of his new flame. First, he persuaded the king to send fresh instructions to-night, on the ground that the Pope would certainly not give him a dispensation to commit bigamy in order that he might marry Anne, and that it would be easier to obtain from the pontiff a decree leaving the validity of the marriage with Catherine to the decision of the legates in England, Wolsey and another cardinal. Henry, having once loosened the bridle, did not entirely return to his submission to Wolsey. Like most weak men, he found it easier to rebel against the absent than against those who faced him. But he was not, if he and Anne could prevent it, again going to put his neck under the cardinal's yoke completely, and in a secret letter tonight, he ordered him to ask Clement for a dispensation couched in the curious terms already referred to, allowing him to marry again, even within the degrees of affinity, as soon as the union with Catherine was dissolved. Knight had found it impossible to get near the Pope in Rome, for the imperialists had been fully forewarned by this time. But at length Clement was partially released, and went to Orvieto in December, whither Knight followed him, before the new instructions came from England. Knight was no match for the subtle churchman. Clement dared not, moreover, mortally offend the emperor, whose men-at-arms still held Rome, and the dispensation that Knight sent so triumphantly to England, giving the legate's court in London power to decide the validity of the king's marriage, had a clause slipped into it, which destroyed its efficacy, because it left the final decision to the pontiff, after all. It may be asked, if Henry believed, as he now pretended, that his first marriage had never been legal in consequence of Catherine being his brother's widow, why he needed a papal dispensation to break it. The papal brief that had been previously given allowing the marriage was asserted by Henry's ecclesiastical friends to be ultra vires in England, because marriage with a brother's widow was prohibited under the common law of the land, with which the Pope could not dispense. But the matter was complicated with all manner of side issues, the legitimacy of the Princess Mary, the susceptibilities of the powerful confederation that obeyed the Emperor, the sentiment of the English people, and, above all, the invariable desire of Henry to appear a saint whilst he acted like a sinner, and to avoid personal responsibility. And so Henry still strove with the ostensible, but none too hardy, aid of Wolsey, to gain from the Pope the nullification of a marriage which he said was no marriage at all, Wolsey's position had become a most delicate and dangerous one. As soon as the emperor learned of Anne's rise, he had written to Mendoza, 30th September, 1527, saying that the cardinal must be bought at any price. All his arrears of pension, 45,000 ducats, were to be paid. 6,000 ducats a year more from a Spanish bishopric were to be granted and a Milanese marquisate was to be conferred upon him with a revenue of 15,000 ducats a year, if he would only serve the emperor's interests. But he dared not do it quickly or openly, dearly as he loved money, for Anne was watchful, and Henry suspicious of him. His only hope, 
was that the king's infatuation for this long-faced woman with the prude's mouth and the blazing eyes might pall. Then his chance would come again. Far from growing weaker, however, Henry's passion grew as Anne's virtue became more rigid. She had not always been so austere, for gossip had already been busy with her good name. Percy and Sir Thomas Wyatt had both been her lovers, and with either or both of them she had in some way compromised herself. But she played her game cleverly, for the stake was a big one, and her fascination must have been great. She was often away from court, feigning to prefer the rural delights of Hever to the splendors of Greenwich or Richmond, or offended at the significant tittle-tattle about herself and the king. She was thus absent when in July 1527 Wolsey had gone to France, but took care to keep herself in Henry's memory by sending him a splendid jewel of gold and diamonds, representing a damsel in a boat on a troubled sea. The lovesick king replied, in the first of those extraordinary love letters of his, which have so often been printed. Henceforward, he says, my heart shall be devoted to you only. I wish my body also could be. God can do it if he pleases, to whom I pray once a day that it may be, and hope at length to be heard. And he signs, Esclipta de la mort du secrétaire, coenquer, cor, avalanti, a vous loyal et plus assure serviteur, ash, a tracarnicherch, air. Soon afterwards, when Wolsey was well on his way, the king writes to his lady love again, quote, The time seems so long since I heard of your good health and of you that I send the bearer to be better ascertained of your health and your purpose. For since my last parting from you, I have been told you have quite abandoned the intention of coming to court, either with your mother or otherwise. If so, I cannot wonder sufficiently, for I have committed no offense against you, and it is very little return for the great love I bear you to deny me the presence of the woman I esteem most in all the world. If you love me, as I hope you do, our separation should be painful to you. I trust your absence is not willful, for if so I can but lament my ill fortune, and by degrees abate my great folly. End quote. This was the tone to bring Anne to her lover again, and before many days were over, they were together, and in Wolsey's absence, the marriage rumors spread apace. The fiasco of Knight's mission had convinced Henry and Anne that they must proceed through the ordinary diplomatic channels and with the aid of Wolsey in their future approaches to the Pope, and early in 1528 Stephen Gardiner and Edward Fox, two ecclesiastics attached to the Cardinal, were dispatched on a fresh mission to Orvieto, to urge Clement to grant to Wolsey and another legate power to pronounce finally on the validity of Henry's marriage. The Pope was to be plied with sanctimonious assurances that no carnal love for Anne prompted Henry's desire to marry her, as the Pope had been informed, but solely her, quote, approved excellent virtuous qualities, the purity of her life, her constant virginity, her maidenly and womanly pudicity, her soberness, her chasteness, meekness, humility, wisdom, decent, right, noble, and high through royal blood, education and all good and laudable qualities and manners, apparent aptness to procreation of children, with her other infinite good qualities. End quote. Gardiner and Fox on their way to Dover called at Hever, and showed to Anne this panegyric penned by Wolsey upon her, and thenceforward, for a time, all went trippingly. Gardiner was a far different negotiator from Knight, and was able, though with infinite difficulty, 
to induce Clement to grant the new bull demanded, relegating the cause finally to the legatine court in London. The Pope would have preferred that Wolsey should have sat alone as legate, but Wolsey was so unpopular in England, and the war into which he had again dragged the country against the Emperor was so detested, whilst Queen Catherine had so many sympathizers, that it was considered necessary that a foreign legate should add his authority to that of Wolsey to do the evil deed. Compeggio, who had been in England before, and was a pensioner of Henry as Bishop of Hereford, was the cardinal selected by Wolsey, and at last Clement consented to send him. Everyone concerned appears to have endeavored to avoid responsibility for what they knew was a shabby business. The Pope, crafty and shifty, was in a most difficult position, and blew hot and cold. The first commission, given to Gardiner and Fox, which was received with such delight by Anne and Henry when Fox brought it to London in April 1528, was found on examination still to leave the question open to papal veto. It is true that it gave permission to the legates to pronounce for the king, but the responsibility for the ruling was left to them, and their decision might be impugned. When, at the urgent demand of Gardiner, the Pope, with many tears, gave a decretal laying down that the king's marriage with Catherine was bad by canon law, if the facts were as represented, he gave secret orders to the legate Compeggio that the decretal was to be burnt and not to be acted upon. Whilst the Pope was thus between the devil and the deep sea, trying to please the Emperor on the one hand, and the kings of France and England on the other, and deceiving both, the influence of Anne over her royal lover grew stronger every day. Wolsey was in the toils, and he knew it. When Charles had answered the English declaration of war, January 1528, it was the cardinal's rapacity, pride, and ambition against which he thundered as the cause of the strife and of the insult offered to the imperial house. To the emperor the cardinal could not again turn. Henry, moreover, was no longer the obedient tool he had been before Anne was by his side to stiffen his courage, and Wolsey knew that, notwithstanding the favorite's feline civilities and feigned dependence upon him, it would be the turn of his enemies to rule when once she became the king's wedded wife. He was, indeed, hoist with his own petard. The divorce had been mainly promoted, if not originated, by him, and the divorce in the present circumstances would crush him but he had pledged himself too deeply to draw back openly, and he still had to smile upon those who were planning his ruin, and himself urge forward the policy by which it was to be effected. In the meanwhile, Catherine stood firm, living under the same roof as her husband, sitting at the same table with him, with a serene countenance in public, and to all appearance, unchanged in her relations to him. But though her pride stood her in good stead, she was perplexed and lonely. Henry's intention to divorce her, and his infatuation for Anne, were of course public property, and the courtiers turned to the coming constellation, whatever the common people might do. Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador, withdrew from court in the spring after the declaration of war, and the queen's isolation was then complete. To the Spanish Latinist in Flanders, J. Luis Vives, and to Erasmus, she wrote asking for counsel in her perplexity, but decorous epistles in stilted Latin, advising resignation and a Christian fortitude, was all she got from either. Her nephew, the emperor, had urged her, in any case, 
to refuse to recognize the authority of any tribunal in England to judge her case, and had done what he could to frighten the Pope against acceding to Henry's wishes. But even he was not implacable, if his political ends were served in any arrangement that might be made, and at this time he evidently hoped, as did the Pope fervently, that, as a last resource, Catherine would help everybody out of the trouble by giving up the struggle and taking the veil. Her personal desire would doubtless have been to adopt this course, for the world had lost its savior. But she was a daughter of Isabel the Catholic, and tame surrender was not in her line. Her married life with Henry, she knew, was at an end, but her daughter was now growing into girlhood, and her legitimacy and heirship to the English crown she would only surrender with her own life. So, to all smooth suggestions that she should make things pleasant all around, by acquiescing in the king's view of their marriage, she was scornfully irresponsive. Part 2 through the plague-scourged summer of 1528, Henry and Anne waited impatiently for the coming of the legate Compeggio. He was old and gouty, hampered with a mission which he dreaded, for he could not hope to reconcile the irreconcilable. And the Pope had quietly given him the hint that he need not hurry. Clement was, indeed, in a greater fix than ever. He had been made to promise by the emperor that the case should not be decided in England, and yet he had been forced into giving the dispensation and decretal, not only allowing it to be decided there in favor of Henry, but had dispatched Compeggio to pronounce judgment. He had, however, at the same time, assured the emperor that means should be found to prevent the finality of any decision in England until the emperor had approved of it, and Compeggio was instructed accordingly. The Spaniards thought that the English cardinal would do his best to second the efforts of the Pope without appearing to do so, and there is no doubt that they were right, for Wolsey was now, the summer of 1528, really alarmed at the engine he had set in motion, and could not stop. Catherine knew that the legate was on his way, and that the Pope had, in appearance, granted all of Henry's demands, but she did not know, or could not understand, the political forces that were operating in her favor, which made the Pope defraud the King of England, and turned her erstwhile mortal enemy Wolsey into her secret friend. Tact and ready adaptability might still have helped Catherine. The party of nobles under Norfolk, it is true, had deserted her, but Wolsey and the bureaucrats were still a power to be reckoned with, and the middle classes and the populace were all in favor of the queen and the imperial alliance. If these elements had been cleverly combined, they might have conquered for Henry was always a coward, and would have bent to the stronger force. But Catherine was a bad hand at changing sides, and Wolsey dared not openly do so. For a few days in the summer of 1528, whilst Compeggio was still lingering on the continent, it looked as if a mightier power than any of them might settle the question for once and all. Henry and Anne were at Greenwich, when the plague broke out in London. In June one of Anne's attendants fell ill of the malady, and Henry, in a panic, sent his favorite to Hever, whilst he hurried from place to place in Hertfordshire. The plague followed him. Sir Francis Poynes, Sir William Compton, William Carey, and other members of his court died in the course of the epidemic and the dread news soon reached Henry that Anne and her father were both stricken at Hever Castle. 
henry had written daily to her whilst they had been separated since your last letter mine own darling he wrote a few days after she left walter welsh master brown thomas care greeren of brereton and john coke the apothecary have fallen of the sweat in this house by the mercy of god the rest of us be yet well and i trust shall pass it either not to have it or at least as easily as the rest have done later he wrote the uneasiness my doubts about your health gave me disturbed and alarmed me exceedingly and i should not have had any quiet without hearing certain tidings but now since you have felt as yet nothing i hope and am assured that it will spare you as i hope it is doing with us for when we were at waltham two ushers two valets and your brother master treasurer fell ill but are now quite well and since we have returned to our house at hunston we have been perfectly well and have not now one sick person god be praised i think if you would retire from surrey as we did you would escape all danger there is another thing may comfort you which is in truth that in this distemper few or no women have been taken ill and no person of our court has died for which reason i beg you my entirely beloved not to frighten yourself nor be too uneasy at our absence for wherever i am i am yours and yet we must sometimes submit to our misfortunes for whoever will struggle against fate is generally but so much the further from gaining his end wherefore comfort yourself and take courage and avoid the pestilence as much as you can for i hope shortly to make you sing la envoye no more at present from lack of time but that i wish you in my arms that i might a little dispel your unreasonable thoughts written by the hand of him who is and always will be yours when the news of anne's illness reached him he dispatched one of his physicians post haste with the following letter to his favorite Quote, there came to me suddenly in the night the most afflicting news that could have arrived the first to hear the sickness of my mistress whom i esteem more than all the world and whose health i desire as i do my own so that i would gladly bear half your illness to make you well the second the fear that i have of being still longer harassed by my enemy your absence much longer who is so far as i can judge determined to spite me more because i pray god to rid me of this troublesome tormentor the third because the physician in whom i have most confidence is absent at the very time when he might be of the most service to me for i should hope by his means to obtain one of my chiefest joys on earth that is the care of my mistress yet for want of him i send you my second and hope that he will soon make you well i shall then love him more than ever i beseech you to be guided by his advice and i hope soon to see you again which will be to me a greater comfort than all the precious jewels in the world End quote. in a few days anne was out of danger and the hopes and fears aroused by her illness gave place to the old intrigues again a few weeks later anne was with her lover at amphill hoping and praying daily for the coming of the gouty legate who was slowly being carried through france to the coast wolsey had to be very humble now for anne had shown her ability to make henry brave him and the king rebuked him publicly at her bidding but until compeggio came and the fateful decision was given that would make anne a queen both she and henry diplomatically alternated cajolery with the humbling process towards the cardinal anne's well-known letter with henry's postscript so earnestly asking wolsey for news of compeggio is written in most affectionate terms and saying amongst other pretty things that she quote, loves him next unto the king's grace above all creatures living End quote. 
but the object of her wheedling was only to gain news of the speedy coming of the legate. The king's postscript to this letter is characteristic of him. Quote, the writer of this letter would not cease till she had caused me likewise to set my hand, desiring you, though it be short, to take it in good part. I assure you that there is neither of us but greatly desireth to see you, and are joyous to hear that you have escaped the plague so well, trusting the fury thereof to be past, especially with them that keepeth good diet, as I trust you do. The not hearing of the legate's arrival in France causeth us somewhat to muse, notwithstanding, we trust, by your diligence and vigilance, with the assistance of Almighty God, shortly to be eased out of that trouble. End quote. Compeggio was nearly four months on his way, urged forward everywhere by English agents and letters, held back everywhere by the Pope's fears and his own ailments. But at last, one joyful day in the middle of September, Henry could write to his lady love at Hever, quote, The legate which we most desire arrived at Paris on Sunday last past so that I trust next Monday to hear of his arrival at Calais, and then I trust, within a while after, to enjoy that which I have so long longed for, to God's pleasure and both our comfort. No more to you at present, mine own darling, for lack of time, but that I would you were in mine arms, or I in yours, for I think it long since I kissed you. End quote. Henry had to wait longer than in his lover-like eagerness he had expected. It was fully a fortnight before he had news of Compeggio's arrival at Dover. Great preparations had been made to entertain the papal legate splendidly in London, and on his way thither. But he was suffering and sorry, and begged to be saved the fatigue of a public reception. So ill was he that, rather than face the streets of London on the day he was expected, he lodged for the night at the Duke of Suffolk's house on the Surrey side of London Bridge, and the next day, 8th October, was quietly carried in the Duke's barge across the river to the Bishop of Bath's palace beyond Temple Bar, where he was to lodge. There he remained ill in bed, until the king's impatience would brook no further delay, and on the twelfth he was carried, sick as he was, and sorely against his will, in a crimson velvet chair for his first audience. In the great hall of the Palace of Bridewell, hard by Blackfriars, Henry sat in a chair of state, with Wolsey and Compeggio on his right hand, whilst one of the legate's train delivered a fulsome Latin oration, setting forth the iniquitous outrages perpetrated by the imperialists upon the vicar of Christ, and the love and gratitude of the pontiff for his dearest son Henry, for his aid and sympathy. The one thing apparently that the Pope desired was to please his benefactor, the King of England. When the public ceremony was over, Henry took Compeggio and Wolsey into a private room, and the day following the king came secretly to Compeggio's lodging, and for four long hours plied the suffering churchman with arguments and authorities which would justify the divorce. Up to this time Compeggio had fondly imagined that he might, with the papal authority, persuade Henry to abandon his object. But this interview undeceived him. He found the king as he says, better versed in the matter, quote, than a great theologian or jurist, end quote. And Compeggio opined at last that, quote, if an angel descended from heaven, he would be unable to persuade him, end quote, that the marriage was valid. When, however, Compeggio suggested that the queen might be induced to enter a convent, Henry was delighted. If they would only prevail upon her to do that, she should have everything she demanded, the title of queen and all her dowry, 
revenue, and belongings, the Princess Mary should be acknowledged heiress to the crown, failing legitimate male issue to the king, and all should be done to Catherine's liking. Accordingly, the next day, 14th October, Compeggio and Wolsey took boat, and went to try their luck with the queen, after seeing the king for the third time. Beginning with a long, sanctimonious rigmarole, Compeggio pressed her to take a, quote, course which would give general satisfaction and greatly benefit herself, end quote. And Wolsey, on his knees, and in English, seconded his colleague's advice. Catherine was cold and collected. She was, she said, a foreigner in England without skilled advice, and she declined at present to say anything. She had asked the king to assign counsellors to aid her, and when she had consulted them, she would see the legates again. As day broke across the Thames on the 25th October, Compeggio lay awake in bed at Bath House, suffering the tortures of gout, and perturbed at the difficult position in which he was placed, when Wolsey was announced, having come from York Place in his barge. When the cardinal entered the room, he told his Italian colleague that the king had appointed Archbishop Warham, Bishop Fisher, and others, to be counsellors for the queen, and that the queen had obtained her husband's permission to come to Compeggio and confess that morning. At nine o'clock Catherine came unobserved to Bath House by water, and was closeted for long with the Italian cardinal. What she told him was under the sacred seal of the confessional, but she prayed that the Pope might in strict secrecy be informed of certain of the particulars arising out of her statements. She reviewed the whole of her life, from the day of her arrival in England, and solemnly swore on her conscience that she had only slept with young Arthur seven nights, a key de lui resto intacta e incorrupta. And this assertion, as far as it goes, we may accept as the truth, seeing the solemn circumstances under which it was made. But when Compeggio again urged Catherine to get them all out of their difficulty by retiring to a convent and letting the king have his way, she almost vehemently declared that, quote, she would die as she had lived, a wife, as God had made her, end quote. Let a sentence be given, she said, and if it be against me, I shall be free to do as I like, even as my husband will. But neither the whole realm, nor, on the other hand, the greatest punishment, even being torn limb from limb, shall alter me in this and if after death I were to return to life, I would die again, and yet again, rather than I would give way. Against such firmness as this, the poor flaccid old churchman could do nothing but hold up his hands and sigh at the idea of any one being so obstinate. A day or two afterwards, Wolsey and Compeggio saw the queen again formally, she was on this occasion attended by her advisers, and once more heard, coldly and irresponsibly, the appeals to her prudence, her worldly wisdom, her love for her daughter, and every other feeling that could lead her to cut the Gordian knot that baffled them all. She would do nothing to her soul's damnation or against God's law, she said, as she dismissed them. Whether it was at this interview, or, as it seems to me more likely, the previous one, that she broke out in violent invective against Wolsey for his enmity towards the emperor, we know not. But the storm of bitter words she poured upon him for his pride, his falsity, his ambition, and his greed, her taunts at his intrigues to get the papacy, and her burning scorn that her marriage— unquestioned for twenty years, should be doubted now, must have finally convinced both Wolsey and Campeggio that if Henry was firm, 
Catherine was firmer still. Compeggio was in a pitiable state of mind, imploring the Pope by every post to tell him what to do. He and Wolsey at one time conceived the horrible idea of marrying the Princess Mary to her half-brother, the Duke of Richmond, as a solution of the succession difficulty, and the Pope appears to have been inclined to allow it, but it was soon admitted that the course proposed would not forward, but rather retard, the king's second marriage, and that was the main object sought. At length, Wolsey ruefully understood that conciliation was impossible, and, pressed as he was by the king, was forced to insist with Compeggio that the cause must be judicially decided without further delay. Illness, prayerful attempts to bring one side or the other to reason, and many other excuses for procrastination were tried, but at length Compeggio had to confess to his colleague that the Pope's decretal, laying down the law in the case of Henry's favor, was only a show document not to be used, or to leave his possession for a moment, and, moreover, that no final judgment could be given by him that was not submitted to the Pope's confirmation. Wolsey was aghast, and wrote in rage and indignation to the English agent with the Pope denouncing this bad faith. Quote, I see ruin, infamy, and subversion of the whole dignity and estimation of the apostolic see, if this course be persisted in. You see in what dangerous times we are if the Pope will consider the gravity of this cause, and how much the safety of the nation depends upon it, he will see that the course he now pursues will drive the king to adopt those remedies that are so injurious to the Pope, and are frequently instilled into the king's mind. Without the Pope's compliance, I cannot bear up against the storm, and when I reflect upon the conduct of His Holiness, I cannot but fear, lest the common enemy of souls, seeing the king's determination, inspires the pope with his present fears and reluctance, which will alienate all the faith and devotion from the apostolic see. It is useless for Compeggio to think of reviving the marriage. If he did, it would lead to worse consequences. Let him therefore proceed to sentence." prostrate at the feet of his holiness i most urgently beg of him to set aside all delays End quote. this cry wrung evidently from wolsey's heart at the knowledge of his own danger is the first articulate expression of the tremendous religious issue that might depend upon the conduct of the various parties in the divorce proceedings the fire lit by Luther a few years previously had spread apace in Germany, and had reached England. All Christendom would soon have to range itself in two divisions, cutting athwart old national affinities and alliances. Charles had defied Luther at the outset, and the traditions of his Spanish house made him the most powerful monarch in Europe, the champion of orthodoxy but his relations with the papacy as we have seen had not been uniformly cordial to him the pope was a little italian prince whilst he was a great one and he was jealous of the slightest interference of rome with the spanish church his position in germany moreover as suzerain of the princes of the empire some of whom already leant to Lutheranism, complicated the situation, so that it was not yet absolutely certain that Charles would finally stake everything upon the unification of the Christian Church by force on the lines of strict papal authority. On the other hand, both Francis and Henry had, for political reasons, strongly supported the Pope in his greatest distress, and their religion was certainly no less faithful than that of the emperor. It was inevitable that, 
whichever side Charles took in the coming religious struggle, would not for political reasons commend itself to Francis, and vice versa, and everything depended upon the weight which Henry might cast onto one scale or the other. His national traditions and personal inclination would lead him to side with Charles, but at the crucial moment, when the first grain had to be dropped onto the balance, he found himself bound by Wolsey's policy to Francis, and at issue with the emperor, owing to the relationship of the latter to Catherine. Wolsey felt, in the letter quoted above, that the Pope's shilly-shally, in order not to offend the emperor, would drive the impatient King of England to flout, and perhaps break with the papacy, and events proved that the cardinal was right in his fears. We shall see later how the rift widened, but here the first fine crevice is visible. Henry, prompted by Anne and his vanity, intended to have his way at whatever cost. Catherine could give him no son. He would marry a woman who could do so, and one that he loved far better than he ever loved his wife. In ordinary circumstances, there need have been no great difficulty about the divorce, nor would there have been in this case, but for the peculiar political and religious situation of Europe at the time, and but for Catherine's unbending rigidity of character. She might have made her own terms, if she had consented to the conciliatory suggestions of the churchmen. The legality of her marriage would have been declared, her daughter recognized as heiress presumptive, her own great revenues would have been left to her, and her title of queen respected. She was not even to be asked to immure herself in a convent, or to take any conventional vow but that of chastity, if she would only consent to a divorce, on the ground of her desire to devote herself to religion. As Compeggio repeated, a dozen times, the only thing she would be asked to surrender was conjugal relations with the king. That had ceased for years, and in no case would be renewed. Much as we may admire her firmness, it is impossible to avoid seeing that the course recommended to her was that which would have best served not only her own interest and happiness, but also those of her daughter of her religion, and of the good relations between Henry and the Emperor that she had so much at heart. Henry, on his side, was determined to allow nothing to stand in his way, whilst keeping up his appearance of impeccability. Legal and ecclesiastical authorities in England and France were besought to give their sanction to his view that no pope had the power of dispensation for a marriage with a deceased brother's widow, and the English clergy were assured that the king only sought an impartial authoritative decision for the relief of his own conscience. The attitude of the English people gave him some uneasiness, for, like all in his house, he loved popularity. The common people, being ignorant, we are told, and others that favored the queen, talked largely, and said that for his own pleasure the king would have another wife, and had sent for this legate to be divorced from the queen, with many foolish words, inasmuch as whoever spake against the marriage was of the common people, abhorred and reproved. The feeling indeed in favor of Catherine was so outspoken and general that the king took the unusual course of assembling the nobles, judges, and so many of the people as could enter in the great hall of Bridewell on Sunday afternoon, the 8th November, to endeavor personally to justify himself in the eyes of his subjects. As usual with him, his great aim was by sanctimonious protestations to make himself appear a pure-souled altruist, and to throw upon others the responsibility for his actions. 
he painted in dismal colors the dangers to his subjects of a disputed succession on his death Quote, and although it hath pleased almighty god to send us a fair daughter by a noble woman and me begotten to our great joy and comfort yet it hath been told us by diverse great clerks that neither she is our lawful daughter nor her mother our lawful wife and that we live together abominably and detestably in open adultery End quote. he swore almost blasphemously that for the relief of his conscience he only sought authoritatively to know the truth as to the validity of his marriage and that compeggio had come as an impartial judge to decide it if catherine was adjudged to be his wife nothing would be more pleasant or acceptable to him and he praised her to the skies as a noble lady against whom no words could be spoken the measure of his sincerity is seen when we compare this hypocritical harangue with the letters now before us to and from his envoys in rome by which it is evident that the last thing he desired was an impartial judgment or indeed any judgment but one that would set him free to marry again one of the most extraordinary means employed to influence catherine soon after this appears to have been another visit to her of wolsey and compeggio they were to say that the king had intelligence of a conspiracy against him and wolsey by her friends and the emperor's english partisans and they warned her that if anything of the sort occurred she would be to blame they were then to complain of her bearing towards the king quote, who was now persuaded by her behavior that she did not love him she encouraged ladies and gentlemen to dance and make merry for instance whereas she had better tell them to pray for a good end in the matter at issue she shows no pensiveness or countenance nor in her apparel nor behavior she shows herself too much to the people rejoicing greatly in their exclamations and ill obloquy and by beckoning with her head and smiling which she has not been accustomed to do in times past rather encouraged them in doing so End quote. for all this and many other things the king does not consider it fitting to be in her company or to let the princess be with her the acme of hypocrisy was reached in the assurance the legates were then to give the queen that if she would behave well and go into a convent the king neither could nor would marry another wife in her lifetime and she could come out to the world again if the sentence were in her favor let her go they said and submit to the king on her knees and he would be good to her but otherwise he would be more angry than ever scornful silence was the queen's reply part three after this catherine lived lonely and depressed at greenwich frequently closeted with bishop fisher and others of her counsellors whilst henry was strengthening his case with the opinions of jurists and by attempts to influence compeggio to greenwich he went accompanied by anne in a brilliant court to show the italian cardinal how bounteously a christmas could be spent in england compeggio's son was knighted and regaled with costly presents in all that bribes the bishopric of durham etc and flattery might do was done to influence the legate favorably but throughout the gay doings jousts and tourneys banquets and maskings quote, the queen showed to them no manner of countenance and made no great joy of nothing her mind was so troubled End quote. well might it be poor soul for anne was by the king's side pert and insolent 
surrounded by a growing party of Wolsey's enemies, who cared little for Pope or Emperor, and who waited impatiently for the time when Anne should rule the king alone, and they, through her, should rule England. Catherine, in good truth, was in everybody's way, for even her nephew could not afford to quarrel with England for her sake, and her death or disappearance would have made a reconciliation easy, especially if Wolsey, the friend of France, fell also. Anne, we are told by the French ambassador, quote, was lodged in a fine apartment close to that of the king, and a greater court was now paid to her every day than has been paid to the queen for a long time. I see that they mean to accustom the people by degrees to endure her, so that when the great blow comes it may not be thought strange. But the people remain quite hardened against her, and I think they would do more if they had more power. End quote. Thus the months passed, the Pope, being plied by alternate threats and hopes, both by English and Spanish agents, until he was nearly beside himself. Wolsey, almost frantically professing his desire to forward the king's object, and Compeggio temporizing and trying to find a means of conciliation which would leave the king free. Catherine herself remained immovable. She had asked for and obtained from the emperor a copy of the papal brief authorizing her marriage with Henry, but the king's advocates questioned its authenticity, and even her own advisers urged her to obey her husband's request that she should demand of the emperor the original document. Constrained by her sworn pledge to write nothing to the emperor without the king's knowledge, she sent the letter dictated to her, urgently praying her nephew to send the original brief to England. The letter was carried to Spain by her young English confessor, Thomas Abel, whom she did not entirely trust, and sent with him her Spanish usher, Montoya. But they had verbal instructions from their mistress to pray the emperor to disregard her written request, and refuse to part with the brief, and to exert all his influence to have the case decided in Rome. By this it will be seen that Catherine was fully a match in duplicity for those against whom she was pitted. She never wavered from first to last in her determination to refuse to acknowledge the sentence of any court sitting in England on her case, and to resist all attempts to induce her to withdraw voluntarily from her conjugal position and enter a nunnery. Henry, and especially Anne, in the meanwhile, were growing impatient at all this calculated delay, and began to throw the blame upon Wolsey. Quote, the young lady used very rude words to him, end quote, wrote Du Bellay on the 25th January, and, quote, the Duke of Norfolk and his party already began to talk big, end quote. A few days afterwards, Mendoza, in a letter to the emperor, spoke even more strongly, quote, the young lady that is the cause of all this disorder, finding her marriage delayed, that she thought herself so sure of, entertains great suspicion that Wolsey puts impediments in her way, from a belief that if she were queen, his power would decline. In this suspicion she is joined by her father, and the dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, who have combined to overthrow the cardinal, the king is so hot upon it, the divorce, that there is nothing he does not promise to gain his end. Compeggio has done nothing for the queen as yet but to press her to enter religion. End quote. Henry, at length, determined that he would wait no longer. His four agents in Rome had almost driven the Pope to distraction with their importunities. Gardiner had gone to the length of threatening Clement with the secession of England from the papacy, and Anne's cousin, Henry's boon companion Brian, 
deploring the Pope's obstinacy in a letter from Rome to the king, was bold enough to say, quote, I hope I shall not die until your grace has been able to requite the Pope and Popes and not be fed with their flattering words. End quote. But in spite of it all, Clement would only palliate and temporize, and finally refused to give any fresh instructions to the legates, or help the king's cause by any new act. To Campeggio he wrote angrily, telling him, for God's sake, to procrastinate the matter in England somehow, and not to throw upon his shoulders in Rome the responsibility of giving judgment, whilst Campeggio though professing a desire to please Henry in everything, in the hope of getting the promised rich sea of Durham, his enemy said, was equally determined not to go an inch beyond the Pope's written instructions, or to assume responsibility for the final decision. The churchmen, indeed, were shuffling and lying all around, for the position was threatening, with Lutheranism daily becoming bolder, and the Emperor growing ever more peremptory, now that he had become reconciled to the Pope. By the end of May, Henry had had enough of dallying, especially as rumors came from Rome that the Pope might revoke the commission of the legates, and the great hall of the monastery of Blackfriars was made ready for the sittings of the legatine court. On a raised dais were two chairs of state, covered with cloth of gold, and on the right side of the dais a throne and canopy for the king, confronted by another for the queen. The first sittings of the legates were formal, and the king and queen were summoned to appear before the tribunal on the 18th June, 1529. Early in the morning of the day appointed, the hall was full to overflowing with bishops, clerics, and counselors, and upon the crowd there fell the hush of those who consciously look upon a great drama of real life. After the bishops of Bath and Lincoln had testified that citations to the king and queen had been delivered, and other formal statements had been taken, an usher stood forth and cried, Henry, King of England, appear! But Henry was at Greenwich, five miles away, and in his stead there answered the ecclesiastical lawyer, Dr. Sampson. Then, Catherine, Queen of England, rang out, and into the hall there swept the procession of the queen, herself rustling in stiff black garments, with four bishops, amongst them Fisher of Rochester, and a great train of ladies. Standing before the throne erected for her, she made a low obeisance to the legates, and then, in formal terms, protested against the competence of the tribunal to judge her case, consisting, as it did, of those dependent upon one of the parties, and unable to give an impartial judgment. She appealed from the legates to the sovereign pontiff, who, without fear or favor of man, would decide according to divine and human law. Then, with another low obeisance, Catherine turned her back upon the court, and returned to the adjoining palace of Bridewell. On the following Monday, the 21st, the court again sat to give judgment upon her protest, which Campeggio would have liked to accept, and so relieve him of his difficulty, but for the pressure put upon him by Wolsey and the court. To the call of his name, Henry, on this occasion, answered in person from his throne, Hear! whilst the queen contented herself by an inclination of the head. When the legates had rejected her protest, the king rose, and in one of his sanctimonious speeches once more, averred his admiration and affection for his wife, and swore that his fear of living sinfully was the sole cause of his having raised the question of the validity of his marriage. When his speech had ended, Catherine rose, between them the clerks and assessors sat at a large table, so that she had to make the whole circuit of the hall to approach the king. As she came to the foot of his throne, she knelt before him for a last appeal to his better feelings. In broken English, 
and with tears coursing down her cheeks, she spoke of their long married life together, of the little daughter they both loved so well, of her obedience and devotion to him, and finally called him and God to witness that her marriage with his brother had been one in name only. Then, rising, she bowed low to the man who was still her husband, and swept from the room. When she reached the door, Henry, realizing that all Christendom would cry out against him if she was judged in her absence, bade the usher summon her back. But she turned to the Welsh courtier, Griffin Richards, upon whose arm she leaned, saying, quote, Go on, it is no matter, this is no impartial court to me. End quote. And thus, by an act of defiance, bade Henry do his worst. Like other things she did, it was brave, even heroic in the circumstances, but it was unwise from every point of view. It would be profitless to follow step by step the further proceedings, which Compeggio and Wolsey, at least, must have known were hollow. The court sat from week to week, and Henry grew more angry as each sitting ended fruitlessly, the main question at issue now being the consummation or non-consummation of the first marriage, until, at the end of July, Compeggio demanded a vacation till October, in accordance with the rule in Roman courts. Whilst this new delay was being impatiently borne, the revocation of the powers of the legates, so long desired by Compeggio, came from Rome, and Henry saw that the churchman had cheated him after all. His rage knew no bounds, and the cardinal's enemies, led by Anne and her kinsmen, cleverly served now by the new man Stephen Gardiner, fanned the flame against Wolsey. He might still, however, be of some use, and though in deadly fear he was not openly disgraced yet. One day the king sent for him to Bridewell during the recess, and was closeted with him for an hour. In his barge afterwards on his way home, Wolsey sat perturbed and unhappy with the Bishop of Carlisle. "'It is a very hot day,' said the latter. "'Yes,' replied the unhappy man. "'If you had been as well chafed as I have been in the last hour, you would say it was hot.' Wolsey, in his distress, went straight to bed when he arrived at York Place, but before he had lain two hours, Anne's father came to his bedside to order him in the name of the king to accompany Compeggio to Bridewell to make another attempt to move the queen. He had to obey, and, calling at Bathhouse for Compeggio on his way, they sought audience of Catherine. They found her cool and serene. Indeed, she seems rather to have overplayed the part. She came to meet them with a skein of silk around her neck. I am sorry to keep you waiting, she said. I was working with my ladies. To Wolsey's request for a private audience, she replied that he might speak before her people. She had no secrets with him, and when he began to speak in Latin, she bade him use English. Throughout, she was cool and stately, and, as may be supposed, the visit was as fruitless as others had been. Wolsey was not quite done with, even yet. He might still act as legate alone, if the Pope's decretal deciding the law of the case in favor of Henry could be obtained from Compeggio, who had held it so tightly by the Pope's command. So when Compeggio was painfully carried into Northamptonshire in September to take leave of the king, Wolsey was ordered to accompany him. Henry thought it politic to receive them without open sign of displeasure and sent the Italian cardinal on his way with presents and smooth words. Wolsey escorted him a few miles on his road from Grafton, where the king was staying, to Tausta, but when next day the cardinal returned to Grafton alone, he found the king's door shut against him. 
and Norries brought him an order that he was to return to London. It was a blow that struck at his heart, and he went sadly with the shadow of impending ruin upon him, never to set eyes on his master more. Before his final fall, there was still one thing he might do, and he was given a few days' reprieve that he might do it. The Pope had pledged himself in writing not to withdraw the legate's commission, and although he had done so, the original commission might still be alleged as authority for Wolsey to act alone, if only the papal decretal could be found. Compeggio's privileged character was consequently ignored, and all his baggage ransacked in the hope of finding the document before he left English soil. Alas, as an eyewitness tells us, all that the packs contained were, quote, old hosen, old coats, and such vile stuff as no honest man would carry, end quote. For the decretal had been committed to the flames months before by the Pope's orders, and the outraged old Italian legate, with his undignified belongings, crossed the channel, and so passes out of our history. Anne had so far triumphed by the coalition of Wolsey's enemies. Her own hatred of him was more jealous and personal than political, for she and her paternal family were decidedly French in their sympathies, and Wolsey, at all events in the latest stages, had striven his utmost to help forward her marriage with the king. The older nobility, led by Norfolk, who had deserted Catherine, their former ally, in order to use Anne for their rival's ruin, had deeper and longer-standing motives for their hate of the cardinal. Although most of them now were heavily bribed and pensioned by France, their traditions were always towards the imperial and Spanish alliance, and against bureaucratic ministers. There was yet another element that had joined Anne's party in order to overthrow Wolsey, it consisted of those who, from patriotic sentiment, resented the galling supremacy of a foreign prince over the English church, and cast their eyes towards Germany, where the process of emancipation from the papacy was in full swing. The party in England was not a large one, and hardly concerned itself yet with fine points of doctrine. It was more an expression of the newborn English pride and independence than the religious revolt it was to become later, and the fit mouthpiece of the feeling was bluff Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, who had publicly insulted the legates in the hall at Blackfriars. It is obvious that a party consisting of so many factions would lose its cohesion when its main object was attained with the fall of Wolsey. The latter had bent before the storm, and at once surrendered all his plunder to the king and to Anne's relatives, which secured his personal immunity for a time, whilst he watched for divisions amongst his opponents that might give him his chance again. Anne's uncle, Norfolk, aristocratic and conservative, took the lead in the new government to the annoyance of the Duke of Suffolk who occupied a secondary place, for which his lack of political ability alone qualified him. Sir Thomas More became Chancellor, and between him and Anne there was no great love lost, whilst Anne's father, now Earl of Wiltshire, became Lord Privy Seal, and her brother, Lord Rochford, was sent as an English ambassador to France. With such a government as this, of which Anne was the real head, no very distinct line of policy could be expected. The Parliament, which was summoned on Wolsey's fall, was kept busy legalizing the enrichment of Anne at the expense of the Cardinal, and in clamorous complaints of the abuses committed by the clergy. But when foreign affairs had to be dealt with, the voice of the government was a divided one. Anne and her paternal family were still in favor of France, but the emperor and the pope were close friends now, and it was felt necessary by the king and Norfolk 
to attempt to reconcile them to the divorce, if possible, by a new political arrangement. For this purpose, Anne's father traveled to Bologna, where Charles and Clement were staying together, and urged the case of his master. The only result was a contemptuous refusal from the emperor to consider any proposal for facilitating his aunt's repudiation, and the serving of Wiltshire, as Henry's representative, with a formal citation of the King of England to appear in person or by proxy before the papal court in Rome, entrusted with the decision of the divorce case. This latter result drove Henry and Anne into a fury, and strengthened their discontent against the churchmen, whilst it considerably decreased the king's confidence in Wiltshire's ability. It was too late now to recall Wolsey, although the French government did what was possible to soften the king's rigor against him. But Henry longed to be able to command the consummate ability and experience of his greatest minister, and early in the year 1530, Henry himself became a party to an intrigue for the cardinal's partial rehabilitation. Anne, when she thought Wolsey was dying, was persuaded to send him a token and a kind message. But when, later, she learnt that an interview between the king and him was in contemplation, she took fright, and Norfolk, who at least was at one with her in her jealousy of the fallen minister, ordered the latter to go to his diocese of York, and not to approach within five miles of the king. Anne's position in the king's household was now a most extraordinary one. She had visited the fine palace, York Place, which Wolsey had conveyed to the king at Westminster, and with the glee of a child enjoying a new toy, had inspected and appraised the splendors it contained. In future, it was to be the royal residence, and she was its mistress. She sat at table in Catherine's place, and even took precedence of the Duchess of Norfolk and ladies of the highest rank. This was all very well in its way, but it did not satisfy Anne. To be queen, in name as well as in fact, was the object for which she was striving, and anything less galled her. The Pope was now hand in glove with the Emperor, and could not afford to waver on Henry's side, whilst Charles was more determined than ever to prevent the close alliance between England and France that the marriage and a Boleyn predominance seemed to forebode. The natural effect of this was, of course, to drive Henry more than ever into the arms of France, and though Wolsey had owed his unpopularity largely to his French sympathies, he had never truckled so slavishly to Francis as Henry was now obliged to do in order to obtain his support for the divorce, which he despaired of obtaining from the Pope without French pressure. The papal court was divided, then and always, into French and Spanish factions, and in North Italy, French and Spanish agents perpetually tried to outwit each other. Throughout the continent, wherever the influence of France extended, pressure was exerted to obtain legal opinions favorable to Henry's contention. Bribes, as lavish as they were barefaced, were offered to jurists for decisions confirming the view that marriage with a deceased's brother's widow was invalid in fact, and incapable of dispensation. The French universities were influenced until some sort of irregular dictum, afterwards formally repudiated, was obtained in favor of Henry, and in Italy, French and Spanish intrigue were busy at work, the one extorting from lawyers support to the English view, the other by threats and bribes preventing its being given. This, however, was a slow process, and of doubtful efficacy after all, because, whilst the final decision on the divorce lay with the Pope, the opinions of jurists and universities, even if they had been generally favorable to Henry,
instead of the reverse, could have had ultimately no authoritative effect. Henry began to grow restive by the end of 1530. All his life he had seemed to have his own way in everything, and here he found himself and his most ardent wishes unceremoniously set aside, as if of no account. Other kings had obtained divorces easily enough from Rome. Why not he? The answer that would naturally occur to him was that his affairs were being ineptly managed by his ministers, and he again yearned for Wolsey. The cardinal had in the meanwhile plucked up some of his old spirit at York, and was still in close communication with the French, and even with the emperor's ambassador. Again Norfolk became alarmed, and a disclosure of the intrigue gave an excuse for Wolsey's arrest. It was the last blow, and the heart of the proud cardinal broke on his way south to prison, leaving Henry with no strong counsellor but the fair-faced woman with the tight mouth who sat in his wife's place. She was brave, quote, as fierce as a lioness, end quote, the emperor's ambassador wrote, and would, quote, rather see the queen hanged than recognize her as her mistress, end quote. But the party behind her was a divided one, and the greatest powers in Europe were united against her. There was only one way in which she might win, and that was by linking her cause with that of successful opposition to the papacy. The Pope was a small Italian prince now, slavishly subservient to the emperor. Luther had defied a greater sovereign pontiff than he. Why should Clement, a degenerate scion of the mercantile Medicis, dare to dictate to England and her king? 